Uh, good morning. Can I welcome everyone to the Justice Committee's 24th meeting in 2015? Can I ask everyone to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices? Is the interview with broadcasting, even when they're switched to silent? There are no apologies. Item 1, Declaration of Interest. Now, first of all, I welcome Margaret McDougall to the Justice Committee and ask her to declare any interest, rel declare any interest relevant to the committee. I have no interests uh, to declare that I'm aware of. Good. I thought you could say I've got no interests. <laughs> We'd have challenged that. Uh, and Roddy Campbell, you wish to make a declaration. Uh, thank you, Convener. Can uh, I remind the committee of my declaration of interest as a member of the Faculty of Advocates? Thank you very much. And we want to item two, decision on taking business in private. I'm asking you to agree to consider item 10 in relation to the Apology Scotland Bill in private. Are you agreed? Thank you. Item three, we move on to consider one affirmative instrument, the Draft Courts Reform, Scotland Act 2014, Consequential Provisions Number 2, Order 2015. And welcome to meeting Paul Wheelhouse, Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs, and Scottish Government officials, Hazel Dagard, Civil Law and Legal System Division, and is it Greg or Greg? Greg Walker, Director of Legal Services. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee agreed to make no observations to the Parliament on this instrument. I will go straight to questions from members, as the Minister will have an opportunity to respond to them after uh, this in uh, the formal debate which follows this item. This is an evidence session. Questions? There are no questions. I move on to item three. We now move to the formal debate. The motion to approve the instrument considered under item three. I invite the Minister to move motion S4M14087 that the Justice Committee recommends that the Draft Courts Reform Scotland Act 2014, Consequential Provisions No. 2, Order 2015, be approved. Does any member wish to. Minister? I'm moved. Does any member wish to speak in the debate on the motion? Nobody wishes to speak. And I take it, Minister, you have nothing to add to that. Silence. Fine, no. You. The question is that motion to S4M14087 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you very much. As members of the as members are aware, we are required to report on all affirmative instruments. Are you content to delegate responsibility for me to sign off the report? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Can I just suspend for a minute because I have officials to swap over now? Thank you. Item 5, uh, consideration of a further affirmative instrument, the draft amendments on legal aid and advice and assistance, miscellaneous amendments, Scotland Regulations 2015. The Minister, of course, is staying with us for this item, as is Hazel Dalgard. I welcome to the meeting Scottish Government officials Denise Swanson, Head of the Access to Justice Unit, and Alistair Smith, Director for Legal Services. The Del and Christina... Katrina, oh, sorry, I didn't see you there. So, blinded by the light. Katrina McKenzie and... I don't know what you are. What are you? I have a law and legal system division. Excellent. Okay. Couldn't do without you. There we are. Um, the Delegated uh, Powers and Law Reform Committee agreed to make no observations to the Parliament on this instrument, but members will note we have received representation on this instrument from some members of the legal profession. I'll go straight to questions from members as members will have an opportunity to respond to any issues in the formal debate which follows this item. This is an evidence session to remind members questions. John? Margaret Roddy. Uh, morning, Minister. Morning. Minister, you'll be aware of the representations we have received, and, and you might say they're unsurprising. People want to be remunerated at uh, a more enhanced rate than the government is offering. We're told the rate is the same as it was in 1992. Is that correct? Um, I maybe ask uh, my colleague Denise Swanson just to answer that question, Convener. Yes, the rates are, are uh, the same um, as the rates have been for since 1992. These are the existing rates and fees that are payable for other elements of work, similar work, uh, across the legal aid system. Thank you. Can I ask, has any calculation been made what that is, what that represents in a real cut terms? Because clearly, you know, with inflation, one thing or another, that's a significant um, erosion of what might be seen as terms and conditions of our profession. I'm not aware of any calculation. I'll maybe defer to colleagues in a second, if that's OK, by Mr Finney. But um, what I would say is clearly we are, um, I'm sure, all aware of the, 
the difficulties we face in terms of managing public finances. So I would just give that proviso. But clearly, uh, if we were in a position to to be able to uh, to, to afford to spend uh, more, um, we'd, that would be something we take into consideration. But but uh, we are under real pressure, as I'm sure the member is aware. But if I could maybe ask uh, Denise Swanson again, just to to check whether there has been any particular calculation done of the uh, real term reduction in fees. No, it's not a calculation that we have done. It, Mr. The term access to justice is used a lot by the Scottish Government, and we would all commend that. And I'll commend any briefing that gives an example of Inverness or the Highlands in it. And there, you may be aware of that example. And the example is that, um, for example, where a person in Inverness is unfairly convicted, he or she is unlikely to be able to find an Inverness based solicitor willing to travel to Edinburgh to conduct a 30 minute summary appeal hearing for remuneration of £27.40 and limited travel fees. And that would probably, you would have to allow a, a, an eight hour travel period for that, you know, three and a half hours and, and a bit of latitude. Of course, that doesn't take in Portree, Stornoway, Kirkwall, Lerwick, Elgin, Fort William, Oban, Campbellton, which all have more complex, uh, in many occasions, communication links with the nation's capital. That isn't equal access to justice, surely. I, I would just um, address, I mean, certainly this, this issue is clearly important to indeed the conveners, constituents, all, all members who have uh, rural interests to ensure that uh, their clients are clients that are, that are presented to local solicitors are uh, entitled to be re represented at the, sh the Sheriff Appeal Court and to have their uh, quality of arms also addressed as well. That's uh, something I'm, I know the committee will be interested in. Uh, what I would say is that, um, as my understanding, the, the travel arrangements um, are not uh, significantly different under the proposed regulations as the current setup. Um, for example, uh, cases will already be heard in Edinburgh, um, perhaps in the, the, the High Court court session, um, uh, in terms of civil cases as well. So they, you know, they will have a, a situation already arising where solicitors would have to face a choice as to whether travel to travel to Edinburgh themselves to represent their clients, or as they often do, as I understand, appoint an agent, another solicitor, uh, a local solicitor in Edinburgh to represent their client for that half, minute, uh, half an hour hearing in, in, in Edinburgh. <clears throat> My understanding is that the travel arrangements, the, the £27 figure that uh, Mr Finney uh, has, has quoted, is not uh, an accurate representation of the compensation for travel that would be available to, to solicitors. Well, no, that, that was, I think that was intended in, in, in relation to the, the fee plus limited travel. So there would, be, there would be, obviously, uh, the, the, the uh, figures that we are aware of, and we have tried to s summarise in terms of the Scottish Legal Aid Board, have provided a detailed breakdown of a case um, based on a Glasgow solicitor attending the, I appreciate it's not an Edin Inverness solicitor, but a Glasgow solicitor attending the Sheriff Appeal Court in Edinburgh, a detailed breakdown. The fees are calculated on a detailed fees basis in the proposed regulations. So the figure of £27 does not represent the totality of the fees that would be, the solicitor would be entitled to to represent their client at a case at the Sheriff Appeal Court. Um, there are specific fees for producing letters, for producing uh, supporting documents to the, to the court, and therefore it's comparing apples and pears to some degree, the figure that has been quoted uh, that Mr Finney is relying upon. But, but there is a comparator, and, and their fellow professionals are paid at a different rate. Uh, can I ask Mr Finney just to clarify the, the point, sir? Well, the, the point is solicitor advocates have been treated differently to advocates. Uh, <clears throat> yes, indeed. Um, solicitor advocates are entitled um, under current legislation to uh, a higher rate of support when they are appearing in the, the court session or, or the high court on behalf of a client. This is a, the uh, Sheriff Appeal Court. Um, solicitor advocates would not, at the, under the current regulations, be entitled to uh, the same rate as, as counsel if they were sanctioned by the Scottish Legal Aid Board. Um, that is something that we are prepared to look at and review over the next six months to see what impact that has on solicitor advocates' business. But I want to make absolutely clear there's nothing to prevent a solicitor advocate, uh, as has been implied in one uh, phrase in the uh, Law Society's letter, which was sent to me and I believe copied to the committee, uh, to exclude solicitor advocates for representing clients. That is not accurate. Um, solicitor advocates may... Uh, may decide on their own part that they are getting insufficient fee and therefore that is a commercial decision for them as to whether they represent a client and I appreciate that is the issue we want to review over the next six months to what extent this impacts on business of solicitor advocates and obviously access to justice and the choice of who represents you in that sheriff appeal court is obviously important for the client. Well, the financial restraints are acknowledged, but you're right. This, <clears throat> but this is this is a, an opening shot. This, this is a new occasion. Surely we want to get it right straight away, <clears throat> not review. Well, I think the, the, the important point that I, I would focus on um, uh, in, in relation to this is 
the degree to which the client who's needing representation in the Sheriff Appeal Court uh, is receiving a quality of arms in relation to uh, the case. Um, the Scottish Legal Aid Board are putting in place a, a policy of flexibility, recognising the, the, the novel nature of the, the new arrangements, uh, the jurisdictional change, and they will ensure that uh, they look sympathetically on any applications for sanction for counsel from uh, those who are defending the, themselves in the appeal court um, uh, in, in due course. So therefore, we would hope to be in a situation where if there is an advocate deputy representing uh, the Crown, that uh, the, uh, those who are make, uh, making an appeal would be equally represented through sanction of counsel through the Scottish Legal Aid Board. So there is a particular gap. I appreciate the, the sense of the position of solicitor advocates and the fact that they, they may face a, a, some disadvantage based on the current fees that they currently get at the, uh, when they appear at a, a higher level. But we um, are doing our best in the need to ensure that we have regulations in place to allow the Sheriff Appeal Court to be up and running for the 22nd December, September, as was the will of the, the Scottish Parliament when it passed the, the Act. And um, our regulations are the our, uh, our, our best foot forward at this point in time uh, with a view to having a review of the, uh, the, the arrangements and their impact in, in due course and will reflect on any particular damage that's done to, to the business of solicitor advocates. But the important thing is to protect the interests of the client. Somebody else in, because I've got a queue. I, you know, I've had a fair Thank stab you. at it. I'll let Margaret Mitchell in, followed by Roddy Campbell, then Elaine Murray. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Convena. And you'll appreciate this has come to us very late in the day. Um, Minister, but the point that seems to be being made, and it's a valid one, is that Scottish Civil Courts Review and the Scottish Parliament's proceedings in relation to the Courts Reform Act Scotland, uh, Scotland Act uh, should be considered in that there was no indication that it was intended solicitor advocate, advocates were to be placed in a disadvantageous position compared to members of the Faculty of Advocates. Or that um, pleaders should be restricted to instructing members of the bar. Um, also, that um, on the contrary, the Act contains a section which sets out the circumstances in which a sheriff or the sheriff appeal court can sanction the employment of counsel, including solicitor advocates. And the point is also made that allowing solicitor advocates to be treated at counsel in criminal cases in the sheriff court would be entirely cost neutral to slab. But what is not neutral is um, the, the fear that the, the solicitor, uh, the society of solicitor advocate, advocates have in opposing the fee regulation that this is unrealistic and would have a significant impact upon the access to justice and administration of justice and choice of representation. Going back to John Finney's point, it is essential we get this right now and if there is some dubiety about it, then I think we should delay it. Um, and I may just add, and this is my last point, con convener, the solicitors also um, contend that to provide advocacy in the Sheriff Appeal Court, um, the payment structures for preparation and conduct of an appeal under these regulations are wholly inadequate. Not a good way to be beginning new court reforms. Well, um, I, I, I recognise the, uh, the arguments that um, Margaret Mitchell makes. These are similar points that have been made to us um, by the Law Society and um, indeed uh, by others. I would just point out a couple of things. Um, firstly, the Scottish Legal Aid Board estimates an appeal and conviction and sentence. A Glasgow solicitor, I appreciate it doesn't address the Inverness uh, point that Mr Finney uh, has raised, uh, could earn fees and outlays of anything from £400 to £600 and more, depending on the time spent preparing travelling, waiting and conducting the appeal. If representing a client from the original defence of case through to appeal at Sheriff Co Appeal Court, a solicitor could easily be paid more than £900 per client. Solicitors are paid in the round for criminal legal aid work, of which summary appeal uh, certificates represent less than 1% of criminal legal aid expenditure. Just 1%. Uh, summary appeals against sentence have averaged around 660 per year and against conviction around 160 per year over the last two years, compared to 86,191 grants of legal aid and assistance by way of representation or ABWAR for summary criminal work in 2013-14. So that puts it in perspective how small a proportion of cases we are talking about here. 
And in terms of choice of representative or sanction for Council's granted, solicitor advocates will be able to access substantial detailed solicitor's fees for the preparation and conduct of summary criminal appeals. And unlike Council, of course, they can provide representation as solicitors in the lower courts without prior sanction. Uh, we have already begun a much wider discussion with both, as I say, with both the Law Society and the Faculty of Advocates, and indeed the Society of Solicitor of Ad Advocates clearly will be important too, as to how solicitor advocates are treated and paid in comparison to counsel. So I do give the committee assurance it's something that we will look very closely at, the impact of this, uh, this, uh, the regulations on solicitor advocates, but I make the point that we're talking about a very small proportion of cases. We are also talking about um, reasonably... I, 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 I challenge the assertion that those fees are untenable if uh, we're talking about £400 to £600 or indeed up to £900 if, uh, if a defence, original, take the original defence of a case through to appeal at Sheriff Court. So these are reasonably substantial figures. And uh, in terms of the hourly rate for appearance at the Sheriff Appeal Court, we are talking about £54.80 per hour, um, which uh, compares very favourably to the minimum wage. Uh, I would just put that point to the committee. <coughs> no, if the those in the law professionally. I appreciate the skills of our I legal... I used to do myself. <laughs> will appreciate that comment. I, I appreciate, convener, the, 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 the skills of... The minimum wage should be of, higher, I think, uh, rather in, than Indeed, the other indeed. Way. We all want to see it, see it higher, indeed, a living wage. But I make the point that... Um, the, the, the valuable skills that solicitors are, uh, are attributed to solicitors are, are well paid in the, uh, in the courts. I appreciate um, that uh, private fees that solicitors may make may, may be more generous than the fees paid by legal aid, but uh, they are nonetheless um, reasonable rates of pay for, for the work that's involved. I'll leave that with you. Uh, Roddy Campbell. Um, thank you, convener. Good morning, um, Minister. Um, I, for fairly obvious personal reasons, I don't want to get involved in a debate about whether these regulations discriminate at the present time against solicitor advocates, but I am obviously grateful to, for your comments that uh, a dialogue about these issues will take place. Um, I'm conscious there was uh, one point in the, the President of the Law Society's letter from Thursday where she discussed uh, other options leading to the savings of 260,000. Perhaps you would comment on that. And secondly, I'm also rather concerned about kind of the speed at which things are happening. It would appear that you had a meeting with the Law Society last Thursday, and obviously this letter is on uh, Friday. Uh, I was wondering whether there was any mileage at all in kind of continuing that dialogue uh, for the present time. Um, and my, my understanding is that we don't require, as a committee, to report to Parliament until the 20th. But is there any mileage in discussions, or should we just bite the bullet today? Well, um, I th I th I'd be certainly grateful for, for guidance from the committee. Uh, clearly, we're here to try and give you as much detail as we can on the, on the uh, facts and figures. I appreciate there may be some concern about the lack of clarity about the, the numbers, and clearly the uh, engagement I just had with Margaret Mitchell was trying to explain that we feel the figures that have been presented are perhaps a misunderstanding on the part of, of, of others uh, as to the rates of pay that will be applicable here. Um, certainly, a discussion I had last week w with the Law Society was helpful. Um, it would be fair to say that, uh, that the Law Society hadn't quite appreciated some of the steps we were trying to take up to that point to address some of their principal concerns, such as the flexibility in terms of uh, sanction for counsel, which we explained to Law Society last week, and we had a discussion about the similar, similar issue about how the um, uh, comparing apples and pears between the previous regulations and, and the proposed regulations. Uh, so I'd be, I'd be grateful for guidance from the committee as to whether they feel they have sufficient information. Um, I would merely point out, though, that if, if the regulations were not to be moved by, by the 22nd of September, uh, solicitors would be in a considerably worse position than if they are uh, implemented by the 22nd of September. And I certainly reiterate my commitment that we will review uh, the detail of, of the impact of these measures on, particularly on solicitor advocates, and the, but also other legal practices to see um, are, if there are any challenges in terms of access to justice along the lines that Mr Finney has outlined, or if indeed there are any concerns about particular disadvantages that, that, that places upon uh, solicitor advocates uh, versus uh, advocates. So um, I'd be grateful for a feel from, from the committee, but it's certainly an option um, should yeah. we be able to secure a slot, obviously, at yeah. a subsequent if, if, if we were to say to, to allow another week um, for a kind of dialogue on this issue before moving to the vote, our convener, if that were possible on the timetable, would well, that be something you think the government I want, could... I want to hear it? from other members yeah. first. But You've made I, your, I, just, I think that's yeah. a fair consideration. Yeah. I want to hear from Elaine Murray and how she feels about Alison. Yes. Um, on the list, yeah. 
Uh, Minister, you made reference to a suggestion by the Scottish Legal Aid Board that uh, the fee paid to a solicitor would be around £400 to £500. However, in the Law Society's letter to you of Thursday, they state that we find it inconceivable that the rates provided in the regulations that the fee to the solicitor would amount to that suggested by the Scottish Legal Aid Board. So there still seems to be significant uh, amount of disagreement, and they're pointing out, for example, that under the, pre the current arrangements, if it went to the High Court, the uh, rate for an hour's hearing would be £292.20, which, although £54.80 is considered more than any of us earn uh, per hour, that is a significant reduction in, in fees for, and presumably that the solicitor or solicitor advocate would have done a considerable amount of additional work on, on, on top of the hour which they're actually in court. Uh, Scottish, uh, the Law Society reckons that the majority of appeal hearings would last no longer than an hour, so this figure of four to five hundred pounds would appear to be a bit of a red herring. And as I would agree with uh, Roddy Campbell that probably we need a bit of a, a additional time to look into some of these figures so that we have a bit more clarity about what the actual uh, uh, remuneration will be. Uh, after the regulations go forward? I, I, I certainly um, uh, recognise the, the concern that uh, Elaine Murray has, has fairly set out about the, the drop in apparent fee rates, and I don't want to make light of that issue. I, I suppose it's the nature in which the fees are calculated is, is different between the previous regime and the one that's proposed, and that we're moving to a situation where um, perhaps there may have been a, a more of a lump sum uh, element to the previous arrangement, which was assuming that uh, preparation was included within that fee, whereas we're now moving to a situation where we're specifying more detailed breakdown of individual items. I just wanted to check, uh, convener, if I may, that um, the, the committee has received a, an example based upon the Sheriff Appeal Court, example that I referred to earlier, uh, a detailed breakdown uh, regarding uh, a, 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 it's described as a kind of expenses incurred by XY to the Scottish Legal Aid Board. From your office? From the Scottish Legal Aid Board, I believe it was a submission. The Scottish Legal Aid Board. We are all looking a bit. Yeah. The, the answer is yeah. no. OK, uh, that, that, that would be helpful, I think, for you to be able to see this convener. So in terms of Mr Campbell's uh, question earlier, this may be something that would be worth considering between now and the decision. But if I can maybe outline just some example of how the fee is broken, broken down. I won't go through the whole list. Can I just slow you down a minute, Minister? Because I think I, I want Alison to come back. I get the feeling that what we really require... And I'll, and Alison, maybe you ask first before we go in. Do you feel, Alison, as I think some others around the table, is that we need to know more, we need more information that to go ahead with item six today when there's other questions that the Minister may be able to answer and debate next week, would be perhaps, if I, does the committee feel that that would be a better way forward? Alison? Well, can I say only if there's a genuine um, desire to, to meet with the Law Society again well, and to try and explore some of that? Because uh, although the Minister said that when he met with them last week, he, they hadn't understood some of the things and it was good for them to see it. They still chose to write quite a strong letter of objection after that meeting, where they say at the end, we ask you to reconsider these regulations as a yeah. matter of urgency. So it's not a little bit of tweaking around no, the fees. No, I don't fees. think it was I meaning that for a minute. there's an issue about access to justice. It seems at the moment there's a very real risk that How do you feel of. then, Alison and the others, about... I mean, we don't have the legal aid letter. There's still major questions about... The, the, what the Law Society is saying, would the Minister be available next week? Um, that I have not, not checked, Convener. I, I, I appreciate that uh, the Cabinet Secretary is also, I think, due to appear for committee um, next week as well. But um, I will... Uh, I mean, that would that. be important for us to sort of know now, because otherwise we will move on to item six. Could I ask uh, to adjourn for... I mean, if you, if you feel... We can, we can certainly check. Adjourn for a couple of minutes to just check so you'd be available next week. If the committee is content, we could continue this as the item six, which would mean, Minister, you would be debating and answering these points. And in the interim, we would trust that you would have these meetings with the Law Society and I, take us a bit further. I, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, Convener, that, uh, that we will get much further with the law signing, that they have already access to this information have yet chosen to take a, a contrary position. Well, um, I would merely point out, as I said earlier on, that if, if we do not at some point move these regulations before the 22nd of September, solicitors will be in a, a greatly well, more you, disadvantaged position than they are. I hear you, Minister, but we can deal with this next week and we can take a vote on it next week. It's certainly. really up to yourself. I'll certainly but, just but check. With respect, uh, my suggestion would be that we suspend for a couple of minutes
minutes and you see if you could make yourself available next week when we, these issues can be properly and thoroughly uh, further addressed a in short, the debate. A short adjournment would be helpful, Convener, so I should check. adjourned for two minutes. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, Minister. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a Sir Humphrey in the house? Yes. <laughs> Um, I certainly, uh, I've just checked, that it will mean cancellation of something to do with na uh, new psychoactive substances, unfortunately, but uh, if the committee does wish me to be appearing next I, Tuesday, I, I think can the do. committee would be very, um, I think this would be a good way forward for the committee and for yourself, Minister, with respect. Okay. Can, so, can in I, which case... Can I make, uh, well, uh, before you, you conclude, Convener, can I just make uh, a point which is, I think, important to make? Um, for clarity's sake, uh, that the, the, the situation in regards to solicitor advocates' position is not created by these regulations themselves. It is, this has already been set in stone by the creation of the Sheriff Appeal Court uh, uh, in terms of the, the, the existing passage of, of le re legislation. So we're not asking the committee to agree to put solicitor advocates in a position that's disadvantageous today. It's merely uh, these are regulations that are required to enable the Sheriff Appeal Court to get up and running on the 22nd of September. So uh, just to give comfort to the committee, they're not uh, being asked to vote on something which will create that position. That is already a position which is set in train by previous vote of the committee and indeed Parliament. Well, that's now on the record. We're, we're, uh, yes, but uh, I don't want to open it all up again. That can all be challenged next week uh, at the debate that we will have fully on it. We can check what's been said on the record by you, Minister. And we will, um, and we will endeavour to, to get a written, further written submission to you before next week. And the legal week. aid letter from Legal Aid Board, which we've not seen, um, which makes it impossible for us to comment. I'm just stopping right there, and that ends that item, and we're not moving on to item six, which will be continued till next week, Minister. Thank, Thank you, you very Kavina. much. And moving on to item seven on the agenda, consideration of an instrument not subject to any parliamentary procedure, Act of a Journal, Criminal Procedure Rules 1996, Amendment Number 4, Sheriff Appeal Court 2015. The purpose of the instrument is to amend the Act of a Journal, Criminal Procedure Rules 1996, in consequence of the establishment of the Sheriff Appeal Court by the Courts Reform Scotland Act 2014. The DPLR Committee has drawn the Parliament's attention to the instruments as they contain minor drafting errors. The Lord President's private office has undertaken to lay amending instruments to correct these errors. Are members content to endorse the DPLR Committee's comments on these instruments? Yes, yes thank you very much. Yep. I'm just, again, another suspension, suspending like mad today, just a couple of minutes to let members get their papers organised for stage two of the Criminal Justice Bill and also for the Cabinet Secretary to come in. Thank you.
very much. I now move on to um, item 8, stage 2 proceedings of the Criminal Justice it's Scotland Bill, and I welcome Michael Matheson, Cabinet Secretary for Justice. I also welcome officials who are here to support the Minister but are not permitted to participate in Stage 2 proceedings. I understand that officials may change over as we progress through the Bill, and when this happens, I'll briefly suspend the meeting. Members should have their copies of the Bill, the Marshall List, and Grouping's Amendments for today's consideration. The Committee agreed on 1 September to change the order of Stage 2 consideration of the Bill. We'll begin consideration at Part 2 and go no further than part six today. As I've indicated, we will consider part one at a later date. And we now move straight on to the Marshall list. We start with the group in corroboration, which consists of amendments 9, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 66 and 68. Amendment 9 is the name of Graham Pearson, who I know does not intend to move that amendment today. Do I take it no other member wishes to move that amendment? Thank you very much. I therefore move on and call Amendment 1, which is in group with Amendments 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 66 and 68. And I call Margaret Mitchell to move Amendment 1 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Margaret, please. Thank you, Convener. I move Amendment 1 in my name. Section 57 of the Bill provides for the abolition of the requirement for corroboration, a provision which tri triggered a storm of controversy aggravated by the intransigence of the then Cabinet Secretary for Justice and the confused and at times contradictory responses from him to the concerns raised during its scrutiny and the debate which followed. It was frankly a travesty that the concerns raised by various stakeholders, including High Court judges and senators of the College of Justice, the Law Society of Scotland, the Faculty of Advocates, the Scottish Human Rights Commission, the CPG on survivors of childhood ad ad adult sexual abuse, and um, learned academics were consistently misrepresented by the former Justice Secretary as a polarised argument between the legal profession versus victims. For let's be quite clear, the attempt to trivialise this crucially important debate and to bulldoze the provision through the Parliament undermined the fundamental right to a fair trial, which every individual who comes into contact with Scotland's criminal justice system has a right to expect. As Lord Gill stated, the rule of corroboration is not some archaic legal relic from antiquity, and it is, in fact, one of the finest features. Others went further, pointing out that if corroboration was abolished any additional, without any additional safeguards being put in place, then it would lead to many more wrongful convictions and create a new category of victims. It is totally unacceptable that the decision of this magnitude was crammed into the miscellaneous provisions of the Criminal Justice Bill based on the fatally flawed recommendation of the Carloway Commission, which failed to consider that rather than just two options being available, namely the retention or abolition of corroboration, there was a third way, which would include looking at corroboration within a wider review of the law of evidence. And I believe it will remain a stain on this majority government's tenure in office that when in the face of opposition from all the other parties, um, including independent members and the aforementioned stakeholders, it then whipped its members into supporting the abolition of corroboration at stage one and then later decided that whilst there would be a review under Lord Bonamy, retention was not an option in the review's remit and abolition would still go ahead a move which struck at the democratic competence of this devolved parliament. So, without doubt, the new Cabinet Secretary annou annou Secretary's announcement earlier this year, following Lord Bonamy's review that a decision to abolish corroboration would be reversed, was widely welcomed, not least by the majority of this committee, as well as by the aforementioned stakeholders. Today, I am relieved and gratified that the Scottish Government has expressed a willingness to support my amendments 1 to 6, removing the relevant provisions, abolishing corroboration from the face of the bill. I move. Yes. You're just number one? Yes. In yes. My and before I take anybody else, I take the Cabinet Secretary to speak to Amendment 66 and the other amendments in the group. Uh, good morning, Convener. Uh, I realise it's uh, not only has it been uh, 
quite some time since the Justice Committee last considered this bill, uh, but there have been significant developments in the intervening period. Uh, so it is perhaps appropriate that this Stage 2 session starts with the issue that has been the subject of much debate over the past few years, the corroboration reforms. Uh, when I took up post as Cabinet Secretary for Justice last November, I said I would wait the, await the outcome of Lord Bonamy's review before reaching any decision on how to proceed. I was very aware at that time of concerns that had been raised by members of this com committee, amongst others, on whether this reform should proceed in this bill in advance of consideration of what other safeguards may be needed to our system. Equally, as a government, we continue to be concerned of the practical effect this rule can have on victims of crimes committed in private, many of whom are some of the most vulnerable citizens in our society. I uh, undertook to listen to views on the reform and uh, take account of Lord Bonamy's recommendations before making any decision, which is what I have done. As I said to Parliament on the 21st of April, Lord Bonamy's recommendations are substantial and complex, and taking all of them forward will have a major impact on the justice system. Given the timing for this bill's parliamentary consideration and the fact that we have not yet achieved a consensus in favour of this particular reform, I took the view that this reform should no longer go forward in this legislation. On that basis, I support Margaret Mitchell's amendments to remove those provisions from the bill. Whilst I understand why some may question why the government had not reached this decision sooner, I do not consider rushing to a judgment would have been appropriate without awaiting Lord Bonamy's report. As I have mentioned previously, I am very grateful to him and his expert group for the considered and collaborative approach they undertook for this review. I needed to await their recommendations in order to ascertain whether it would be feasible within this legislation uh, and its timetable to take forward this reform alongside their propo proposals. As it has turned out, that has not been possible. But I hope that members understand why the government considered awaiting Lord Bonamy's report to be the most appropriate course of action. I also want to pay tribute to this committee for its detailed scrutiny at stage one of this reform, amongst the other provisions in the bill. Uh, the government's decision to take forward the safeguards review was very much informed by the further evidence uh, your committee elicited during the stage one committee sessions. So whilst this session may bring to an end the corroboration reform in this particular legislation, I hope a platform has been created on which to build future reforms to our evidence and procedures, uh, procedures uh, laws in Scotland. As I mentioned when I made my statement in Parliament in April this year, we will start work to consider Lord Bonamy's recommendations. The corroboration reform and any other relevant issues with the aim of creating a balanced and cohesive package, package of reforms in due course. Throughout the course of the debate on corroboration, we have all heard powerful testimony from organisations which represent victims. Now uh, may not be the time for this reform, but I am sure none of us are complacent and that this means our system should stay the same forever. I will now move uh, to Amendment 66 in my name, uh, which uh, proposes moving Section 62 to the start of Part 6 of the Bill. This is a consequential and technical amendment prompted by the removal of all the other provisions in Part 2. Uh, section 62 is being moved to a better home in Part 6 amongst the provisions found there. Finally, uh, the Government's amendment at 68 provides for the deletion of the jury majority provision from the Bill. This reform is very much related to the corroboration reform, as it was intended to provide a further additional safeguard if the corroboration rule was abolished. Lord Bonamy's review group, as uh, you will be aware, has recommended that jury research should take place to ensure that, and I quote, decisions about what, if any, uh, changes to jury size, majority and verdicts may be appropriate are made on an informed basis, close quote. I have decided it is appropriate for this recommendation to be taken forward, which should provide a very important evidence base for any further changes to jury size and verdicts. 
Uh, the Scottish Government will now consider the exact remit for such research and methodology. In taking forward this work, my officials will continue to engage with justice sector partners, organisations and academics on this issue. Lord Bonamy's reference group specifically recommended research on effects of jury size of sizes of 12 and 15 and the not proven and not guilty verdicts and the effect of requiring unanimity. I would uh, want consideration of the I want consideration of the remit to start with these issues and add others as considered necessary. I would hope that such research would commence before the end of this parliamentary session and I will certainly keep this committee informed of its progress. I therefore consider it is preferable to retain the current jury system until this jury research has been completed. So Amendment 68, if passed, will mean that Scotland will continue with the present system of a simple majority being required for a guilty verdict. Alongside the jury research, we will consider all of Lord Bonamy's proposed reforms, the corroboration rule and the other relevant reforms holistically and take our time in developing a future package of reforms, which I hope can achieve a general consensus. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. We have a list of um, members, Gill, Rod and Alison. Thanks very much. Um, I intended actually to come here today and not say too much, because I am a reluctant participant in this formal move, Minister, but I am forced to uh, speak. Uh, First of all, I, I maybe need to make an um, announcement to the, the board, is to the, to the committee, uh, that I am a former member of Rape Crisis and of 12 years. Uh, and I want to speak on behalf of people that this decision today will have an impact on. Um, and I don't think people should be crowing too loud today, to be quite frank with you because people will definitely be affected by this. There was a prospect that women in particular and sometimes children were denied or are denied access to justice. They can't even get past the fiscal because of the lack of corroboration, because things happen in, in private and what happens to them in these circumstances that no one can come forward and stand up for them. But often people who work know when people are lying or not and how it affects them. And for me, corroboration, the sooner it goes, the better it will be uh, uh, for people. Um, the idea that, that people who are treated so badly and the system has no answer for them is wrong. It's one of the, in fact, I believe it's the only justice system in the world where there's a barrier for people that are raped, for instance, or seriously uh, sexually uh, assaulted. So therefore, I think we should be really silent uh, and not make big statements as to how it affects the legal profession who have been guarding this as if it was something holy when no other jurisdiction in the world has this method. I, and I'm hoping, Minister, that at some point, very soon, that the government is in a position to present something back to this parliament so that people, women and children, can get their day in court before their peers and be judged by them rather than the system of corroboration. Thank you. Uh, Rod, Alison, after that, please. Uh, thank you, Convener. Just a few brief points. Amongst um, the negativity of uh, Margaret Mitchell's comments, I think we ought to, to pay tribute to the sterling work that Lord Bonamy's uh, reference group has carried out, and also to recognise uh, the swift way in which the Cabinet Secretary responded to that. Uh, so I, I think that's a positive and not a negative. And can I echo the kind of eloquent comments that Gil has made, Gil Patton has made, in, in relation to... Um, certain victims. I think there's clearly an access to justice issue which remains and will remain until we can advance this issue further. And finally, in relation to jury research, this is kind of novel in Scotland. We we'll wait the findings of that with great interest, but I think uh, the Cabinet Secretary's amendments on that subject are um, sensible. Uh, Alison, followed by um, Christian, please. 
thank you. Um, convener, I mean, there's no doubt that the proposal to remove the requirement for corroboration was the most contentious element of this bill. Um, and as it was drafted at the time, and as it's still drafted this morning, at risk of bringing our legal system, I think, into disrepute through miscarriages of, of justice and, and through wrongful conviction. Um, Lord Bonamy's recommendations are, are, that have made it very clear that there's no doubt that removing corroboration would have had profound implications for our justice system. And as the Cabinet Secretary himself has said, um, he proposes substantial and complex changes um, that are all interrelated. It's worth remembering that Kenny McCaskill, the previous Cabinet Secretary, wanted to press ahead even after he recognised that he needed to ask Lord Bonamy to look at these issues. And he asked us to somehow do that and deal with the issues afterwards. Michael Matheson's comments this morning around how substantial and complex the issues are underlines what a reckless um, plan that that would have been. And I think we need to just reflect that it was only the unprecedented suspension of the bill for 18 months that has allowed us to get to the point where we can address this in a much more measured um, and sensible way, and indeed in the way that the committee themselves recommended in their Stage 1 report. And that was um, secured following, uh, not least my uh, suggestion, that we do suspend that. Um, so I'm grateful that we've got to the point where we are today. I think we didn't need to be um, waiting 18 months to produce pre um, progress some of the other issues that are quite important within this bill and there would have been an easier way forward with it, uh, had it not been for the intransigence of Kenny McCaskill 18 months ago. Question followed by John Finney. Thank you, Convener. I just want to put on the record, first of all, that uh, it was a very good uh, debate around uh, the subject of corroboration. Uh, but I want to make it clear that uh, I've not changed my mind. Uh, it's not only about corroboration, but it's particularly for me the absolute requirement for corroboration, which I want to see removed from the judicial uh, system, and I want it to remove as soon as possible, uh, like uh, Gil Patterson, uh, my, my, my colleague on my right, uh, I, will, uh, I will want it to be uh, ready as soon as possible. John Finney, followed by Eileen. Uh, thank you, Kavina. I, I will be supporting Margaret Mitchell's um, amendment. I, I don't support many of her comments or the personal comments that have been made. This is about process, not about individuals as I see it. Um, I, I think this proves that our system works, that there is scrutiny and, and I think that people listen and I think we should uh, reflect positively on that. I think there's been a lot of good debate about it. I think, <coughs> excuse me, I think there's been a lot of ill-informed and intemperate debate and certainly as someone who supports corroboration the notion that in so doing I have a disregard for victims I find deeply offensive I have to say. Thank you. Elaine? Yes, um, I also will support Margaret uh, Mitchell's amendment. I think there were a lot of things said, particularly in the stage one debate, which would have been better not said, and I was personally offended by some of the things which were said, but you know, that has to be forgiven, I suppose, uh, because of the you know, we've made progress uh, now, and uh, you know, I think we, we need to look to the future. Uh, I really wanted actually to welcome what was said about the jury research, because that was a point made during uh, the stage one consideration that we needed to have some way in doing during research. And there's difficulties with it, but um, I think we welcome that because I think it's not, you know, it's without, we need to understand the way in which juries come to decisions to understand how best to address some of the issues around victims. Yes, and, and usually, Cabinet Secretary, I also want to speak because um, I had a long-standing, as you're aware, opposition and concern about the abolition of corroboration. Not easy to do uh, in the face of my party. Um, and I continue to have these reservations about abolition of corroboration. I welcome uh, these um, amendments of Margaret Mitchell. This does not mean, I say to Gil Patterson, I have not anything. I have the same concerns shared by John Finney for those who are the victims of rape or sexual assault. My concern is that it may be that people say they just want their day in court, but actually they want their day in court and a conviction and my concern was that if we simply had the credibility of one witness against the accused, that witness might be undergoing a more um, aggressive interrogation than if there were supporting evidence. I think that would only be appropriate in the balance and the interest of justice. And my concern was it might have been 
counterproductive. And of course, while we've focused on sexual assaults and rape, many, many crimes take place with no eyewitness, because corroboration is not an eyewitness, it's another piece of evidence. A burglary, a house theft, um, the theft of a car, an assault, these will all not have eyewitnesses. And again, there has to be some corroboration, and one cannot, in my view, uh, abolish the need for corroboration for one particular crime, say sexual assault or rape, and separate it from other crimes which may not have the so-called other piece of evidence. So I'm afraid, for me, I still remain convinced that, that corroboration is one of the proud aspects of the Scottish criminal justice system. And I remind members that um, the legal profession represent victims as well as the accused, uh, and that throughout the profession there was concern, even those who represent victims, that abolition of corroboration would be counterproductive. As I say, I do not crow about this. It's been a hard fight for many of us. Uh, I'm glad we are now in the position of taking slow moves towards considering what progress can be made to bringing to court and to a successful prosecution those who ought to be in front of the court and successfully prosecuted. Separately, I note in the um, review of the jury system, it really was to do with numbers, but Elaine Murray has raised the point that I would like to raise with you, which is it would have to be discreet, obviously, but research into why juries come to decisions that they come to. Uh, because I have had conversations with uh, senior law officers who've advised that they have been in circumstances where a young man has raped a former partner. They are convinced this has happened. The evidence led it in that direction, but the jury did not convict of rape because they did not want that young man on that occasion, perhaps never to happen again, to be labelled a rapist. So there are difficulties with the way juries work through things in their head when they come to decisions. And I think we need to look at why it seems sometimes to members of the public and to others that it is obvious that someone should have been convicted, but they were not. You know, without, dis without intervening in the privacy of the jury deliberations, that some research into why it is in certain cases people are not convicted. I think that would be an additional assistance. So I would ask the Cabinet Secretary in looking at the jury, not just to look at numbers and majorities, but perhaps why and how juries come to their decisions when we're looking at uh, cases. Um, that's um, my bit said on that. But again, I welcome Margaret's amendments. And Margaret, unless the Cabinet Secretary wish to say something else, I'll take Margaret to wind up. Kevin, it may be helpful if I just Certainly. pass comment uh, on the, the point that you've raised specifically around the uh, jury research. Having announced today that we're going to take forward that jury research based on recommendation that came from Lord Bonamy's report, um, as you've identified, um, I should uh, issue a note of caution in that this process will not be a quick one. Um, it will take a, a considerable period of time in order to carry out this research in a thorough and detailed way. There are obviously some legal issues that we also have to navigate around as well in order to undertake this uh, more fully. My intentions are to have the research commissioned on the terms which have been set out by Lord Bonamy in the review group's recommendation. But as that progresses, I'm content to look at whether there are further areas that it can then explore into and move into um, as it's progressing. So my mind isn't closed uh, to the possibility of further research into some of the reasoning aspects that go on within, uh, within, uh, within the juries, uh, within juries and coming to their deliberations. But its principal aim at the outset will be that uh, to fulfil the recommendation that was made by the independent review group uh, chaired by Lord Bonamy. Thank you. Margaret, to wind up. Thank you, convener. Can I say at the outset, there was no intention in my opening comments to crow, but I think it was important to set out the situation that brought us to the point where abolition of corroboration was almost de facto by default and, and being pushed through the Parliament. And if we are to learn from these mistakes, then I think it's important to highlight that. So I just reiterate, um, convener, that Corroboration is far from archaic, and I concur with the Cabinet Secretary that the rule of corroboration will continue to evolve in conjunction with uh, the rule of law of evidence and other measures. 
to ensure access, access to justice for all. And that includes addressing the vexing problem that Gail Patterson has rightly raised about the low conviction rapes for, raw, law, uh, for rape and sexual assault. And in fact, I hope it will give him some comfort that another amendment tabled, and hopefully we'll get to today, helps uh, or seeks to address that very issue and has the support of these um, organisations who deal with uh, rape victims. I move the amendments. Take you press your amendment. Press amendments, my name. The question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're all agreed. We're not agreed. There'll be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Abstains. One. That numbers, please. You should be writing them down. Eight for one abstention. Can you write it down usually? Um, I move on to Amendment 2 in the name of Margaret Mitchell. Already debated. Margaret, move or not move? Yes. The question is Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. We're not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Abstentions. Eight in favour, one abstention. I go straight to Amendment 3 and I call it in the name of Margaret Mitchell. Already debated. Margaret, move or not move? Moved. Questions Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. There will be a division. There is not agreement. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Any abstentions? Eight in favour, one abstention. I call Amendment 4 in the name of Margaret Mitchell. Already debated. Margaret, move or not move? Moved. Question is Amendment 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Abstentions? Eight in favour, one abstention. That amendment is therefore agreed. Call Amendment 5 in the name of Margaret Mitchell. Already debated. Margaret, move or not move? Moved. Question is Amendment 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Are there any abstentions? Eight in favour, one abstention. That amendment is agreed. We'll call Amendment 6 in the name of Margaret Mitchell. Already debated. Margaret, move or not move? Moved. The question is Amendment 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. There will be a division, there is disagreement. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Abstentions. Eight in favour, one abstention. That amendment is agreed. The question is that section 62 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Are we all agreed? Sorry. There is a life out there, yes. Call amendment 66, name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated. Cabinet Secretary move formally. Moved. The question is that amendment 66 be agreed to. Are we all Agreed. agreed. Call Amendment 6. Sorry, I beg your pardon. I call Amendment 54 in the name of Alison McInnes and a group in its own. Alison, please to move and speak to Amendment 54. Thank you very much, Convener. Amendment 54 would raise the age of criminal responsibility from 8 to 12. And this would bring it in line with the age of criminal prosecution at the moment. That was raised to 12 in 2010 to reflect the extensive body of evidence that children shouldn't come into contact with the justice system at a young age. But we're left with an anomaly uh, in regard of criminal responsibility. And I think the current law is out of touch with our understanding of children's maturity and their capacity to make decisions and understand the consequences of their actions. Statistics that I have secured through freedom of information legislation from the Children's Reporter show that approximately 1,500 children between the age of 8 and 11 were referred to the panels on offence grounds during the last four years, and almost all of them automatically received a criminal record because they accepted those grounds of referral. The children's hearing system will no doubt subsequently help most of them to address their offending behaviour, and they will mature into responsible adults. That's, after all, what we want to achieve. So surely it is perverse to subsequently further punish and disadvantage them as they move into adult life by branding them criminals. Their childhood convictions will need to be declared for decades or even for the rest of their life. How can that be right? How can we allow a child's opportunities to be curbed so severely at such a young age? Handing eight or nine-year-olds criminal records is destructive, inappropriate response to their offending and I want the law to change. When very young children display troubling or criminal behaviour, it is most often because they themselves are deeply troubled or and vulnerable. And many of these children will have experienced trauma or neglect or have been victims of abuse. They are first and foremost also in need of protection. 
Scotland has the lowest age of criminal responsibility in Europe and trails painfully behind international best practice. The UN Committee on the Rights of the Child has stated that 12 is the absolute minimum it expects. And Tam Bailey, the Commissioner for Children and Young People, was right to say that criminalising children as young as eight has long tarnished our international reputation. Members yesterday received a joint letter in support of my amendment from 17 organisations, including Bernardo's, Aberlour Child Care Trust, the Together Alliance for Children's Rights and the, the Scottish Youth Parliament. The Law Society has also backed my amendment. I hope all members will join me in ensuring that Scotland upholds the human rights of some of the most vulnerable children in our society. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Elaine, please. And followed by John. Thank you, Convener. I support Alison McInnes's amendment. Um, I see no reason when we do not prosecute children under 12, we should be dishing out a criminal record to a child of under 12. And I think that Scotland is behind much of the rest of the world in this issue. Now, I know that the letter to the convener, I know that from the Scottish Government, I don't actually understand the argument against this amendment. It says that um, there will be a lot of underlying issues, including disclosure of criminal records, forensic samples, police investigatory powers of victims, and community conference. Conference are complex. I cannot understand why, by increasing the age of criminal responsibility, would create all these difficulties, particularly since children under 12 are not being prosecuted anyway. So I just don't understand that particular argument. I don't think, I, I know I do appreciate at one time this was a very controversial issue, but I think the times have moved on and I don't think that this change is as controversial as it was some years ago. Uh, and it certainly is my intention to support the amendment. John, please. Sorry, looking in the wrong direction. Yes. Hey, thank you, Convener. Uh, I commend Alison for, for her speech there and did her extensive work in it. Um, I made four notes. The notes were extensive body of evidence, and I think that's unequivocal. The term UN, and we are out of kilter. The Children's Commission are the very person we charge with looking after wellbeing and human rights. This, to me, seems to be a very fundamental and straightforward issue, and I'll certainly be lending my support to Alison on it. Rod, followed by Margaret Mitchell. Um, obviously, Alison McInnes has obviously referred to the 2010 Act, which said that no one under the age of 12 can be prosecuted. And obviously, I'm very mindful indeed of a large number of children's organisations who basically suggest that uh, it's unfinished business that the age of criminal responsibility has not been lowered. The question is, is this bill the right method of doing this? Is it, how complex is that? Well, we've heard from an academic, Professor Leverick, she thinks the bill's not the right place. There are clearly issues of disclosure, and there are issues of the need for a consultation. I know that when the previous Cabinet Secretary gave evidence in January 2014, he said at that time it's not possible to have too many consultations running at, at the same time. Then that may or may not have been a good argument, but we clearly need a consultation. Uh, and I think I would recognise that we do need to get on with this issue. It's not going to go away. Uh, I would look to the Cabinet Secretary for some reassurance as to a timetable for dealing with this issue. Uh, Margaret Mitchell, please. A huge amount of sympathy behind um, the intent in, in this amendment and, and what Alison McInnes has said. How, however, I suppose I'm a, a little wary of the law of unintended consequences and the fact that we haven't actually taken detailed evidence on this issue. And, and therefore, I wait with interest to, to hear what the, the Cabinet Secretary has to say. I'm, I'm not convinced that this is necessarily the right place to properly uh, scrutinise and debate this change. Christian. Yes, I just wanted to add uh, um, my sympathy as well for the intention of the, uh, of the amendment. But uh, consultation, I think Vlad Campbell put it uh, in one word. Consultation is what we need. That kind of uh, debate has to happen and is not to happen only at committee, but out there. And we need to have a, a very good consultation just to make sure that the people in Scotland give their views on what it should be. Yes, I, I, Margaret, I'm agreeing with you again. I, I think a huge sympathy for it, but it's a major change in the law. And that I would have great concern if we were to proceed with this without testing the evidence that's before us. May very well, in fact, make it even more compelling. But that would be a good thing. But I think to make a major change in law without a consultation by the government, without this committee even testing the evidence in front of us, would be a mistake and might indeed, as Margaret says, we have unintended consequences. So for that reason, though very sympathetic I am, um, Alison, I won't be supporting your amendment. Um, Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, thank you, Convener. The minimum age of criminal responsibility is a substantial and complex issue, uh, and we do remain open to change being made in this particular area. However, we have serious concerns that Amendment 54 does not address the policy, legislative and procedural implications of change or offer the requisite safeguards. Uh, there are significant underlying issues on the disclosure of criminal records, uh, use of forensic samples, uh, police investigatory powers and the rights of victims. There is rightly particularly sensitivity, particular sensitivity where serious violent or sexual behaviour is involved. Uh, we have a strong track record in promoting and safeguarding children's rights. In 2010, uh, this government changed the law so that no one under the age of 12 can be prosecuted in the criminal court. Uh, children aged between 8 and 11 uh, facing allegations uh, uh, of having committed an offence can be dealt with by the children's hearing system, which takes an approach centred on the child's welfare and their best interests. In 2014, via the Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014, uh, we introduced a duty on ministers to consider ways uh, to give better effect to the UN Convention on the Rights of Children in Scotland. And the children's hearing system is internationally recognised for its child-centred, needs-based approach to children in conflict with the law. The hearing system can be said to provide the special protection measures referred to in the UNCRC terms. We do share concerns about young children potentially having a criminal record as a result of childhood behaviour, which can impact on their life chances. And I understand this is one of the main reasons uh, why Alison McInnes has brought forward this particular amendment. Offence grounds uh, established uh, through the children's hearing system do have implications in terms of disclosure. Uh, the established policy is that serious violent and, sex and serious sexual offences should continue to be disclosed, while reducing the impact on life chances of low-level offending in childhood. Although uh, such cases are mercifully small in number, serious offending and real harm involving children under the age of 12 does occur. It is vital that police have appropriate powers to establish the facts, including when there is no cooperation from parents. It is important that we have a clear way forward in addressing these issues. I can therefore advise the committee that an independent advisory group is being established. The group will address these underlying issues in respect of disclosure of criminal records, forensic samples, police investigatory powers, victims and community confidence, taking account of the minimum age of prosecution, the role of the children's hearing system and UNCRC compliance. The group is expected uh, to meet in the next six weeks and will bring forward recommendations for further consultation uh, early in 2016. I believe this approach uh, provides a way which would allow us to deal with these complex legal issues and to do so in a considered way. And I therefore ask Alison McInnes to withdraw Amendment 54. Thank you very much. Alison, to wind up, please. Thank you. I have listened to what the Cabinet Secretary has explained today and, and what he said in his recent letter to the committee. Um, we have been told over and over again that this is under active consideration. I raised the issue with um, the former Cabinet Secretary at stage one when we were taking evidence, and I was assured that it was yet again under active consideration, but it seems to be continually put off. Um, the convener said this was a major change. I don't believe it is a major change. The major change happened when the age of criminal prosecution was changed. And this seems to me that we need to follow through and tidy up this anomaly, which leaves children um, carrying a criminal record, um, which doesn't seem at all, at all fair. Um, if there are outstanding issues around disclosure of criminal records for forensic samples and police investigative Powers, excuse me, I don't believe you've adequately explained that to ourselves or, or to the committee, and I see no reason why those couldn't be resolved at stage three uh, if we agree the principle today. We have an opportunity today to approve the principle once and for all. It seems to me disproportionate to say that we need to kick this into the long grass for another uh, year or so before we can begin to consider it. I don't doubt that the government could craft an amendment for stage three that could allow them to address some of the practicalities via secondary legislation and ensure that the implementation date, perhaps, of this provision uh, was after those guidelines had been issued. So I will press my amendment today and I urge the Cabinet Secretary and all the members of the committee to seize this opportunity. 
The question is, Amendment 54 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. Those in favour, please show. Four. Those against, please show. Abstentions. So it's me. Well, I'm, I'm, I keep to what I said before, so I'm voting against the amendment, as I said, so I'm casting my vote that way. Thank you. That amendment is disagreed. I call Amendment 102 in the name of Michael McMahon. Michael, at last, group with Amendments 103 and 104. Uh, Michael, please, to move Amendment 103 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Thank you uh, very much, for, uh, Convener, for inviting me to speak to my amendments. Uh, it seems a long while ago, but members will recall that I gave evidence during Stage 1 of this Bill in December 2013 in the context of my own Criminal Verdicts Scotland Bill. That Bill does two things. It removes the not proven verdict and increases the size of the majority required for a jury to return a guilty verdict, including in circumstances in which a juror has died or where, the, where jurors are ill. These proposals are inextricably linked. I introduced my Bill because I have long been convinced that the three verdict system is no longer defensible in a modern system of justice. I believe it causes confusion and uncertainty for both victims of crime and for the accused persons, and that the principle that all accused persons are innocent until proved guilty entitles them to a straightforward acquittal in every case where the prosecution case against them cannot be established beyond a reasonable doubt. I believe that this reform is necessary in order to maintain confidence in the judicial system, as a not proven verdict, which effectively represents another form of acquittal, continues to at best cause confusion, if not bring it into complete disrepute. In addition, as the not proven verdict does not convey the same clarity as a guilty or not guilty verdict, it can leave an accused person stigmatised, particularly as they have no right to a retrial or appeal in order to clear their name. Should the not proven verdict be removed, there is a small potential for the number of guilty verdicts to increase, and so to ensure that these convictions are safe, I propose to increase the majority required to convict. As it happens, the Scottish Government made a similar proposal in the Criminal Justice Bill, but for different reasons. For the Government, an increased jury majority was a safeguard in the context of its proposal to remove the requirement for corroboration. So now it is no longer pursuing that proposal in this Bill. It no longer sees a need to increase the jury majority, as you have already heard from the Minister in the debate on the first group. But if I can persuade the Committee to remove the not proven verdict, I will also try to persuade you to retain Section 70 with minor modifications, rather than remove it as the Government proposes. My Bill was referred to this Committee, and I look forward to giving evidence to the Committee during uh, Stage 1, uh, and I look forward to, uh, to giving uh, evidence on that. However, given the Government's proposed amendments to the Criminal Justice Bill in relation to the jury majority, I felt it was prudent to lodge my own amendments. Today's debate, therefore, provides a useful opportunity for an initial discussion on these important issues. It is for those reasons that I move Amendment 102. Thank you very much. Um, any other members wish to speak? Roddy? Yeah, uh, um, I've got some sympathy for Mr McMahon in the sense that I kind of think in, in the debate about so many other issues on this bill that his particular um, uh, argument has not necessarily been addressed as fully as it might have been. But I am kind of conscious that we have kind of jury research which is about to be embarked on. And I would have thought if we were going to take a proper view on kind of the question of not proven or otherwise, then we should do so after that kind of research is completed. Come back to this issue. Any other member? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Convener. I'm grateful to Mr McMahon for uh, setting out his reasons for uh, wishing to see a change in the jury system. Um, I know this is an issue which he's been pursuing uh, for some time now in order to seek legislative change in this area. I'm also aware that there has been support for a change to the verdict system, in particular uh, the abolition of the not proven verdict. And I'm not sympathetic to the position uh, taken by Mr McMahon, but I think recent developments do have a significant impact on any reform in this particular area. Uh, the Government Amendment uh, 68, which we have already debated, uh, provides for the deletion of the provisions increasing the jury majority that Mr McMahon now seeks to amend. As I mentioned earlier, when moving Amendment 68, I am taking forward Lord Bonnyman's recommendation that jury research should take place 
Although we are still considering the final remit, um, I do agree with Lord Bonham's recommendation that it should include research on the verdicts available to the jury, as well as jury majorities and size. In light of this work, I consider it preferable to retain the current jury system until this research has been completed, so we have a more detailed level of evidence on which to base any future reform. I therefore, uh, seek to, I therefore still intend to move Amendment 68, uh, and on that basis I would ask Mr McMahon not to press his amendment. Michael, to wind up, please. Okay. Uh, thank you, Convener. In response to Roger Campbell, yeah, jury research um, is, is welcome. Of course, we want to try and establish uh, what people think when they're, they're making these decisions, but I would point out to the member that I have consulted on this bill on three occasions and taken on board uh, issues that have been brought to my attention by those who have uh, responded to that. In all circumstances, um, the, the link between a, a jury, or the, the, the size of the jury and the majority uh, making a decision was brought to my attention because of one major factor. In all cases, the purpose of the trial is to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the case brought by the prosecution has been proved, that someone is, is either with confidence found guilty or not. If we have a, a situation in which, regardless of the level of severity of the, the crime that is being tested, the changing of the mind of one individual can mean the difference between someone being found guilty or acquitted on either a not proven or a, a not guilty verdict. It hardly suggests that the case has been proved beyond a reasonable doubt. 8-7 would mean that seven people had a serious doubt about the, the case that was brought by the, the, the prosecution. That, to me, suggests that we know, and the legal profession knows, that a simple majority from a, a jury of 15 is not sustainable. So no amount of kicking it into the long grass will change that principle. The evidence that I have received in the consultations that I have heard before make it absolutely clear that a simple majority is not sustainable. So while I respect Lord Bonamy, I also recognise and I have a huge regard for the legal profession. I also know that the legal profession has a tendency to look for the long grass whenever it is possible to find it. Um, there are a number of areas in which this bill has already suggested we find the long grass for major issues that need to be addressed. I have consulted on this extensively. There is already a lot of work out there in relation to concerns around the size of majority. Using my own analogy, that case has already been proved. There is not a not proven around the size of a majority. The case has been established, and I think beyond a reasonable doubt we need to move to two-third majorities. But having heard the, the concerns of members on the committee, I am minded to ask for permission to withdraw my amendments to, to debate further, if possible, with the Minister, um, so that we can examine these further. So with the, the committee's uh, approval, I would like to withdraw uh, the amendment for You're further discussion. To, members sought leave to withdraw. You are agreeable. Thank you very much, yes. Michael. Um, so we then move on to... The question is that sections 63 to 65 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 67 and name the Cabinet Secretary and a group in its own Cabinet Secretary to move and speak to Amendment 67. Uh, can we, in line with uh, Sheriff Principal Bowen's recommendation, uh, section 66 of the bill, as introduced, uh, would have regard, would required the prosecutor in a case to lodge a written record covering both the Crown state of preparation and that of the defence. In evidence uh, given to this committee at stage one, representatives from the Crown Office, the Law Society and the Faculty of Advocates all expressed a preference for having prosecution and defence lawyers lodging records of their own state of preparation. Uh, the previous Cabinet Secretary for Justice undertook to review this matter and this committee welcomed that commitment uh, to do so. 
Having spoken to those involved in Sheriff Court procedures, uh, Amendment 67 will remove the obligation upon the prosecution to lodge the written record. Uh, rules about how and when written records are to be lodged will be left to court rules. This is to allow the prosecution and the defence to lodge their respective parts of the joint written record separately. This will mirror current practice in the High Court and is supported by the Crown Office and the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. And I therefore move Amendment 67. Thank you very much. Um, any other members wishing to speak? Margaret, followed by Roddy. Yeah, if you clarification, uh, Minister, you know, preparing a joint record suggests that um, there's been agreement by both parties if they're lodged separately. Is there any room for disagreement? Is there, are we creating um, by um, having the joint record, uh, not a joint record being prepared, but individually prepared and lodged, um, the possibility that there could be some disagreement or some point that isn't, um, that isn't agreed? I ask this merely for information. I'll let you answer that finally when I take... Roddy, okay. you've got the question as well. Uh, can I just say, I think it's a, a sense of proposal to make each party responsible for providing its record and it will enable, in my view, the court to see if there are problems where, where the default lies. Cabinet Secretary. Um, the principal change that this makes is that rather than actually being the prosecution who are now responsible for submitting this final uh, submission to the court, both from the Procurator Fiscal and the Crown Office side and from the Defence Agent's point of view, both of them will now actually be responsible for submitting them. It will then be one document for the court uh, and obviously for the presiding sheriff or judge to then uh, consider. Um, but it's to facilitate flexibility, to allow the defence to lodge theirs and to allow the prosecutor to lodge theirs. But it will then become one particular report which will then be considered by the court. Thank you for that. Right, thank you very much. Um, the question is that Amendment 67 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that Section 66 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that Section 67 to 69 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? I call Amendment 103 in the name of Michael Mann McMahon. Already debated Amendment 102. Michael, move or not move? Thank you very much. I call Amendment 104 in the name of Michael McMahon. Already debated with Amendment 102. Move or not move? Not move. And that's fine, Michael. That's your amendment. has gone. I'll call Amendment 68 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated in the group in corroboration. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. The question is that Amendment 68 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that Section 71 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? I'll call Amendment 106 in the name of Margaret Mitchell. Group with Amendment 49. Margaret, please to move Amendment 106 and speak to... Officials for this part. Oh, of right. The... <laughs> so... I didn't look up. I need to be shouted at. Thank you. I'll pause for a minute. Thank you very much. Moving on, call Amendment 106 in the name of Margaret Mitchell, group with Amendment 49. Margaret, please, to move Amendment 106 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, automatic error release is a complex issue, a point which was highlighted by the individual evidence which this committee heard from various academics during the scrutiny of the Prisoners' Control of Release Scotland Bill. This significant body of evidence quite correctly identified the issue of cold release as problematic. It is essential to get the issue of release of offenders from prison absolutely right, which is why I will be seeking the committee's permission to withdraw Amendment 49 in my name, which was tabled last year before the issue of cold release had been raised. And it is why I believe the Scottish Government should be prepared to look again at the provisions within the Prisoner Control of Release 
uh, Scotland Act, which does not deal effectively with prisoner release and which does not end automatic early release. Instead, it simply changes automatic early release from the two-thirds point to six months. Um, Professor Cyrus Tata got to the nub of the problem when he pointed out at stage two that this bill would not end automatic early release and that is, it is the short term end where there is much more to criticise, where people are released nominally on supervision but do not get supervision or the kind of support that they need. The following shortcomings have also been expressed by the Law Society of Scotland regarding the procedure surrounding the bill, namely to propose such a radical change to penal policy as that contained within section one of the bill without the prior consideration of a large body of expert evidence and to amend proposals significantly, significantly when a bill is already before the Justice Committee is of significant concern. The Law Society went on further to suggest the creation of a body of experts with power to hear evidence from persons with professional knowledge in the field before this bill progresses. So I regret the Cabinet Secretary did not act on the advice of the Law Society and my amendment therefore seeks to establish a dedicated commission to examine the rules governing the, re the release of offenders across the board, including both short-term and long-term prisoners, which looks at the rules governing release and post-release um, supervision. Uh, I sincerely hope the Cabinet Secretary uh, will um, support this in an effort to get automatic early release absolutely right, um, given its you look, and um, given that expertise of individuals would provide a unique and unrivaled insight into our criminal justice system and this particular aspect of sentencing. I move amendment 106 in my name. Thank you. Any other members wishing to speak? I uh, have Elaine, then Rod, please. Uh, thank you, convener. I'm pleased that Margaret Mitchell has withdrawn 49 because I was a bit puzzled by it because it seemed to propose going back to a system of, of cold release. Uh, so I'm pleased that that is not in front of us now. With respect to Amendment 106, um, it see, again, it, it also seems to be slightly behind what's happened because the Prisoner Control of Release Bill has actually been passed. And despite our, my reservations about some aspects of it, it has actually been passed. Uh, the other thing, I mean, a, a Margaret Mitchell cited Professor Tata, but both Professor Tata and Professor McNeil and I think others had said that prisoner release should be considered in a wider context of sentencing policy. So just a commission to review prisoner release I don't think is actually sufficient to tackle the entire issue and I would prefer to see some sort of review in the context of sentencing, alternatives to imprisonment and the rest of it rather than just a commission on prisoner release arra arrangements. Rod? Please. Very briefly, convener, because Elaine's made most of the points I was going to make, but it seemed a little bit like Margaret was re rehearsing the arguments that we had in relation to the 2015 bill, which we have just passed. Um, but one thing that was missing was uh, the cost of this little exercise, so uh, I think we should just bear that in mind. Uh, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, convener. Amendment 106 proposes a commission to look at early release for prisoners. Uh, the committee will recall uh, that this government established exactly such a commission when we took office. It was called the McLeish Commission, uh, which submitted an excellent report back in 2008. And we remain committed to the independent McLeish Commission report. The report was clear that long-term reform to the system of early release uh, was needed but such reform could only be taken forward when prisoner numbers were at a long-term, lower, sustainable level. I'm keen to progress policy to help meet the aspirations of the McLeish uh, report uh, and how we use our prisons. Uh, that is why I took through the reforms to automatic early release that this committee scrutinised earlier this year, and I will continue to seek to progress policies that will help achieve fundamental reform to our penal policy. 
Um, I've listened to, uh, to uh, Margaret Mitchell's explanation with some interest, although a large part of it appears to be uh, based upon rehearsing arguments uh, that were debated during the course of the uh, Prisoner Act, uh, which has since been passed by Parliament. And I'm aware that she's also stated that she no longer intends to move Amendment uh, 49. However, I think it is worth bearing in mind uh, that uh, if this amendment was passed by uh, the committee, uh, it's likely to cost in the region of £100 million uh, per year to implement. Uh, and we estimate that by ending all automatic early release and severely curtailing even the possibility of discretionary early release in the manner provided uh, for would result in an increase of the prison population of around 3,100. That's approximately a 40% increase in Scotland's already high prison population. Now, if this approach is to be taken, and it's Margaret Mitchell's view that this is the approach that should be taken, it's unclear to me where the additional £100 million per year is to be found from and where the additional 3,100 additional prisoners are to be placed. Convener, I believe that uh, these amendments are unnecessary, and this is an issue which was considered in great detail uh, by the committee when we were considering uh, the prisoner uh, release bill earlier this year. And on that basis, I would ask the committee to reject them. Margaret. Yes, the main point is the Prisoner Control and Release of Scotland Act has been passed but won't come into effect for a number of years now, so there is room to, to look at this issue again, given that it doesn't abolish automatic rally release. And clearly there are cost implications here, which is why the Commission should be set up to consider all these aspects in an effort to get automatic early release correct. Um, I'll reflect on, on what has been said and come back again, I think, so at stage... To withdraw from the committee. Well, not withdraw from the committee, well, withdraw, <laughs> withdraw your amendment. Certainly, um, it's withdraw, a Freudian slip. Certainly withdraw amendment um, 49. Well, you've not got to that. Sorry. You've moved amendment 106. Do you seek leave to withdraw 106? Yes, I, I seek withdraw to re remove that at present. Is the committee agreeable? Yes. Correct. Thank you yes. very much. Right. The question is that section 72 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? I call Amendment 49, Margaret Mitchell. Ready to debate Amendment 106. Move or not moved? Moved. You're moving it. Oh, sorry. I'm the other way around. Not moved. <laughs> it's all right. We all knew what you meant, Margaret. <laughs> Keep taking the pills. Uh -huh. That's not moved. Not moved. The question is that Section 73 to 81 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Now, this is where we really come unstitched, because I'm calling my own amendment. So you can laugh when I get this wrong, Margaret. Call Amendment 77 in my name group with Amendment 8. I'm moving Amendment 7, and I'm going to speak to the other amendment. Um, this looks complicated, but it's not really. I'm going to take you back to CADR and the emergency legislation that was brought in under the C Criminal Procedure Legal Assistance Detention Appeals Scotland Bill. If you remember, that was brought in and we went through stages one, two and three all on the same day because uh, there might have been a flood of applications as people have been interviewed without the option of legal representation. But on that day, we did something else. We changed the power of the Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission and we gave extra power to the High Court. Now, I thought that came in by mistake, um, and I hope it was. So what I want to do is to take you back before the Criminal Procedure Bill came in in 2010 to what the uh, Criminal um, Procedure Scotland Act could do then under Criminal Cases Review Commission and to the High Court. And in those days prior to this 2010 emergency legislation. If someone brought an application to the criminal SCCRC for review of their case to say there'd been a miscarriage of justice, the Criminal Cases Review Commission had to look at all the aspects, the new evidence, and say, is this in the interest of justice? This is referred to the High Court. That was the test. And if it was in the interest of justice, it was referred to the High Court. Now, the High Court had to take that referral and hear that case. That was then. But what happened under this 2010 emergency legislation is we changed that. And what happened then was we introduced new tests. The test for the Criminal Cases Review Commission was that it had to, the interest of justice was still there, but we brought in a test of finality and certainty. 
which seemed strange to me because it was in the interest of justice that a case is referred. Why are we talking about finality and certainty? For whose finality and certainty are we speaking? We're not speaking for the person who brought the application and the SCCRC says, we think it's in the interest of justice. But it got worse than that, in my view, because thereafter we also amended it, and this is what my um, uh, Amendment 7 deals with, Amendment 8 is to do with the SCC, and we did worse than that. It meant that, let's say, under the new regime that we have, you go to the SCCRC, they say, we think it's in the interest of justice this case goes to the High Court, and we've done the finality and certainty test, and we're going to refer it to the High Court. But you see, the High Court now is in a position where it can say, well, that's all very well. But we don't think we should take this referral in the interest of finality and certainty. Now, it seems to me that where we were before with the independence of the SCCRC, away from politicians, away from the High Court, remember the High Court's got judges in it, and they're also in the Appeal Court, you were able to say this case should have another crack of the whip. So it's going to the High Court. Now what we say is it has to pass the test of finality and certainty here, and then even if it does that, it goes to the High Court, and it's now going to pass another test of finality and certainty and can be rejected. And I don't think that's right. And what I'm simply asking the committee to consider and the Cabinet Secretary is we go back to where we were before the Criminal Procedure Legal Assistance Detention of Scotland Bill changed the position. Now, I think the reason why they changed it was they thought there'd be a flood of applications to the appeal, criminal cases appeal court following Canada, but there weren't and there wasn't. Because I've got the figures here, and if you look at between 1999 and 2014, the Commission received a total of 1,844 cases, completed the review of 1804, and referred 122 cases. It's tough. You make an application to the SCCRC and it's not an easy path to get back to hear your case heard again. It's quite tough. And many of them are successful because the tests that the SCCRC do are very firm. So what I'm asking the committee to do is ask yourself, why did we change this? We changed this for me for political expediency in 2010. We should be back where we were in 1995, leaving the SCCRC to be powerful again to look at the cases and say, in the interests of justice, this should be referred to the High Court, and the High Court cannot refuse to accept that case. Let's get rid of the test of finality and certainty. It's unjust, and certainly let's not have the High Court have the right to refuse a referral that's already been through these tests. That's my I move. I've moved seven. Does anybody else wish to speak? John Roddy. I, I, I do support do support it and commend you on your explanation of it. It, it, is, it is a complicated area, but it is about the relationship between these various bodies and the gatekeeping role for their own workload that the High Court has at the moment. So I, I would lend my full support to your proposals. Roddy. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I was just checking. I wasn't sure that, that I quite agreed with your definition of what the Bill was actually seeking to do. I think we have moved on from uh, the 2010 Act. Um, <laughs> But whereas the, uh, the High Court will no longer have a gatekeeping role, it still has the possibility of using an interest of justice test uh, uh, and therefore having kind of an ultimate review of things. Uh, obviously, on one side, we have an array of people supporting the great work of uh, the Crim Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission, not least of which is the Law Society and the Faculty of Advocates. Against that, we have uh, kind of comments from the Crown and indeed uh, from Lord Carlaway that uh, to, to not have this provision would mean that if new evidence came to light, they would be powerless to do things. Um, I'm conscious also that uh, when we took evidence, we, we, it came about that it was accepted that uh, uh, only these appeals have an interest of justice test and normal appeals to the High Court don't. So I think the arguments are very finely balanced. I would hope, and I will um, uh, oppose Christine's amendment, but I would hope that these finely balanced arguments will prove to be largely academic and that the situation which would arise where there had been a reference from the, the Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission on an interest of justice test which subsequently was overturned because the, uh, 
the, the High Court, uh, the, the, the Court, the Appeal Court took the view that their, uh, in their view, the interests of justice should uh, uh, prevent the appeal uh, proceeding. I think that would cause public disquiet. So whilst I uh, accept the provisions, uh, I hope that this debate will prove to be more academic than anything else. Anyone else? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Convener. The effects of Amendment 7 and 8 would be to make changes to how the Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission decide whether to uh, refer cases to the Appeal Court and how the Appeal Court considers such appeals. Uh, the Commission has an important part to play as one of the checks and balances in our system of justice. It has a mix of one-third legal and two-thirds lay members with the experience of the criminal justice system to ensure that they apply a suitable balance of expertise and knowledge to the cases it considers. It has special powers to refer cases to the appeal court when the normal appeal process has been exhausted, where it considers a miscarriage of justice may have occurred, and it is in the interests of justice to have the case considered by the appeal court. However, the final decision on whether or not a miscarriage of justice has occurred is made by the Appeal Court. Uh, that is to ensure that the final decision on the rights on an individual uh, in any case is decided by an independent and impartial tribunal, which is required under ECHR. Uh, given the role of the Appeal Court in these cases, it would be inappropriate to remove the ability of the Appeal Court to consider the interests of justice when considering appeals based on a Commission referral. It is key to their role as final decision maker that they consider where the interests of justice lie in each and every case, and I would therefore invite the Committee to reject Amendment 7. Amendment 8 uh, would seek to remove the requirement for the Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission to consider the need for finality and certainty in criminal proceedings when deciding whether to refer a case to the Appeal Court. The Commission took the need for finality and certainty into account as part of the interests of justice test when before the Criminal Procedures uh, Act 2010 and when it came into force. Indeed, it is another ECHR concept that requires to be taken account of when cases are dealt with in our justice system. It has been noted uh, that the Commission does its job very well. It allows it, uh, to continue, uh, to allow it to continue to do its job well. It's important that the Commission continues to take the need of finality and certainty into account when reaching a decision on whether or not to refer a case to the Appeal Court. And I therefore invite the committee to reject Amendment 8. Um, well, I thank you for your comments, Cabinet Secretary. I wholly disagree with them, and none of this was said in the debate and the emergency legislation which brought this in. In fact, there was scant, nobody really knew what I was talking about at the time. So I think it came in very quickly without very much consideration. And to remind uh, my colleague uh, Rod, Campbell here, that this is what was inserted, the law in force now under the 1995 Act, inserted by the 2010 Act for the High Court, says, where the Commission has referred a case to the High Court under Section 194B of this Act, the High Court may, despite Section 194B1, reject the reference if the Court considers that it is not in the interest of justice that any appeal arising from the reference should proceed. So they're uh, overturning an interest of justice test by the SCCRC. It then goes on to say in subsection 2, in determining whether or not it's in the interest of justice that any appeal arising from the reference should proceed, the High Court must have regard for the, to the need for finality and certainty in the determination of criminal proceedings, judge and jury in their own case, and gatekeeping something that should have been for the SCCRC. And as the Cabinet Secretary said, in, in prior to this amendment going into the 1995 Act for the SCCRC, they did consider finality and certainty in the interest of justice. This was put in as a more heavy-handed way, I think, of simply saying we stop some cases going forward because of CADR. And that's my concern. We've already had legislating in haste and have unintended consequences. I think there are unintended consequences here. I know that the Criminal Cases Review Commission were very, very unhappy at the time that they were being hamstrung in this way. Uh, and therefore, I will continue to press uh, my amendment. You may, yes. to specifically to uh, some of the points that the convener just made there. Um, 
One of the changes which is contained within the Criminal Justice Bill is based on the recommendation that was made by Lord Car Carloway, and that is to change the provisions that were set out within the 2010 Act and the gatekeeping point which the convener referred to at the beginning of considering any appeal to push that to the end. So now the appeal court are not in a position where they can refuse to accept a referral from the Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission on the basis of in the interests of justice until they have actually considered the appeal. It will then be considered as a matter in the interests of justice after the appeal has been heard before the court. So the gatekeeping that the member has making reference to in the 2010 Act in this Act, this bill, is actually shifted from the beginning of the process to the end of the process. And it's only right that the appeal court has the power to be able to consider matters in the interests of justice at that particular point, having heard the matter. That doesn't give me any comfort because that could mean that someone could succeed at appeal, but the High Court sitting as an appeal court could then say, however, we don't think it's in the interest of justice and finality, the appeal is granted. So I think that's actually worse in some respects. Uh, so I, I regret, Cabinet Secretary, I remain, as you know, a difficult customer. Uh, this is another bee in my bonnet, and it's a big bonnet with lots of bees in it. Uh, so I continue to press. I'm pressing my amendment, and I'm going to ask that the questions Amendment 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. There will be a division. Those in favour, please show. One, two, three, four, five in favour. Those against, please show. Three. And abstentions? One. That amendment, is, that amendment is agreed to. I call amendment eight in my name, already debated to amendment seven. I'm moving that amendment. The question is that amendment eight be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Are we agreed? All agreed. That amendment is agreed to. The question is that section 82 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? I call amendment 107 in the name of Mary Fee, group with... Ah, I think we'll do, do Mary's yes, because she's here. Good. Yes, Mary, we'll just go on with yours and then we'll stop after your amendments. Call Amendment 107 in the name of Mary Fee, group with Amendments 108 and 109. Mary, please, to move Amendment 107 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Thank you, um, Convener. The amendments in my name are designed to ensure that children and young people are provided with the necessary support and protection should their parent or carer be sent to prison. Evidence shows that children and young people affected by the imprisonment of a parent are particularly at risk of neg negative outcomes such as stigma, bullying, trauma and mental health problems. And this is an issue which has been raised in previous parliaments and has received cross-party support. There are an estimated 27,000 children in Scotland with a parent in prison. And until we can accurately identify these children and the actual numbers of them affected, their particular needs arising from parental imprisonment will not be taken into account by local authorities and other public bodies as part of their children's service planning process. In short, these children will continue to slip through the net, and as such, I have also included amendments on the development of a national strategy and reporting requirements on ministers. Amendment 107 will require Scottish ministers to introduce through subordinate legislation a national strategy on the impact of sentencing on children affected by parental imprisonment. A robust system is needed which ensures stronger links between the justice system, statutory services and voluntary organisations working with children and families affected by imprisonment. A national strategy is necessary to ensure that a more strategic, coordinated, multi-agency approach is taken by the COPFS, the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, Police Scotland, SPS, local authorities, NHS boards and the voluntary sector to identify the well-being needs of children affected by parental imprisonment and to provide support and assistance to meet these needs. Amendment 108 would require Scottish ministers to prepare an annual report on sentencing and the impact of parental imprisonment. As I have stated previously, the impact of sentencing and parental imprisonment on children is often overlooked. These children are often unseen and their well-being needs um, created by the imprisonment of a parent are overlooked or simply not picked up as part of GERFEC. An annual report would support the development of a national strategy, as well as act as part of the monitoring of the effectiveness of child and family impact assessments, which I will come on to shortly. 
The details to be provided would include the total number of people who have responsibility for a child who have been remanded in custody or sentenced to a term of imprisonment or other detention, the total number of people who have responsibility for a child who have been convicted of an offence and sentenced, the total number of child and family impacts undertaken where people who have responsibility for a child have been remanded in custody or sentenced to a term of imprisonment, and confirmation of the total number of children who, following an impact assessment, require a child's plan under Section 33 of the Children and Young People Scotland Act. Requiring Scottish ministers to produce an annual report focusing on children affected by imprisonment will increase the focus on these issues. It will also help to improve the evidence base by ensuring key agencies will have to provide Scottish ministers with a wide range of information. Amendment 109 would ensure that a child and family impact assessment is undertaken when a person is remanded in custody to await trial or sentencing or when the person is sentenced to a period of imprisonment. A child and family impact assessment is vital to ensure that processes are put in place to assess the likely impact on the well-being of the person's dependent children or, chi or child within the family. Such assessments will help identify support and assistance which may be necessary to meet the dependent child's well-being needs arising from these circumstances, as well as those of the remaining family. Child and family impact assessments have been recommended by Scotland's Commissioner for Children and Young People since 2007, by the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child in 2011, by Bernardo Scotland and the NSPCC in their report, An Unfair Sentence, All Babies Count. It's been endorsed by Together Scotland, SCCYP and Families Outside, and widely supported through the responses to my Members' Bill consultation, the Support for Children Impact of Parental Imprisonment Scotland Bill. My Members' Bill consultation highlighted that current procedures and processes are not currently working for these children, as key justice services are not under GERFEC duties, and therefore these children often remain hidden and unsupported. There is currently no robust form of identification or assessment in place for this group. Criminal justice social work reports are not always requested or conducted, and when they are, they do not touch on the child and family. Their intention is to establish what the family can do for the offender in terms of reducing re-offending, not what statutory services can do to support the family. And the voices of children are lost in the justice system. Um, Child and family impact assessments are needed to trigger to ensure that children affected by parental imprisonment are recognised and supported through GERFEC. And I move Amendment 107. Thank you very name. much, Mary. Um, Roddy. Oh, sorry, Alison, Margaret and John. Uh, my principal objection to these amendments is that, uh, the committee, we've simply not considered these matters in detail. I also think there may be an overlap with the Children and Young People's Scotland Act 2014. And, and in, in opposition to some of the comments that we made from children's organisations, can I remind the committee of evidence that was given to us by Dame Ailish Angelini in June 2012, when she said she had uh, her com commission on women offenders had received excellent evidence from Dr. Nancy Lukes on the impact that family and child impact, settlements, impact statements could have, but they gave careful consideration to the matter and did not believe that any judge who sentenced without reference to the fact that someone had children and the impact that the imprisonment would have would be doing their job appropriately. But nevertheless, they took the view we must move away from creating more bureaucracy, more reports, and look at what would make a difference to the sentencing process. In her view, consideration of children should be critical to that process, but I believe that such issues should arise out of the professional's training. It should be their bread and butter. That is how social workers, defence solicitors and judges should approach the matter. So that's a kind of opposition to, to the, the pro-assessment lobby but my main objection to this is simply that the committee has not considered this in detail and I think it would be inappropriate to therefore support these amendments at this stage. Thank you, Rod. I've got Alison followed by Margaret McDougall. Alison? Well, 
Rod Campbell might well be right that that's how it should operate, but it's quite clear from what Mary Fee has said and many other agencies um, over the years that that is not what happens. Um, there's clear evidence of the impact of uh, parental imprisonment. And as Mary said, we've got 27,000 children around the country uh, with a parent in prison, and they're currently being let down. There's no doubt that they have particular needs. And I would commend the enlightened approach that Mary Fee has, and I'll support her amendments. Margaret. Thank you, and I should declare at this point that I am a member of the cross-party group on families affected by imprisonment. Um, and I will be supporting Mary Fee's uh, amendments because there is a lack of consistency on how children of parents taken into custody and uh, actually imprisoned are dealt with across the country. Uh, so I believe that impact assessments should be consistent across the country and that a national strategy should be put in place with regular reporting to the government. Thank you, Margaret. John, followed by Margaret, Margaret Mitchell. I'm going to get my Margaret smuggled. I knew that would happen. John. Thank you, Kavita. Uh, like Alison, I, I was somewhat surprised at, uh, at Rod uh, Campbell's comments there. The should bit, I actually thought, with what, what you did outline, you were actually making the case in support of... of, 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 of Mary's... I mean... What I would say that is in relation to this, uh, slipping through the net was a phrase that uh, Mary used. Of course, the net catches some, and it's not to suggest that there's a complete disregard for the well-being of children. I know that um, across um, many parts of the country, there's a lot of good work takes place with active involvement, a lot of collaboration between the, the authorities on this. But clearly, um, as has been highlighted, the purpose of reports to the, the, the sheriff prior to sentencing are not picking up on aspects here that are absolutely crucial. So whilst I'm, I'm not necessarily enthusiastic about more annual reports, the, the principle of having the obvious gaps that have been highlighted uh, addressed um, enjoy my full support. Margaret, please. Yes, I, I too have a lot of sympathy with um, Amendment 109. Um, and I see clarification. I think Mary McPhee has given this, that these would kick in the point of custody and after sentencing. And again, while um, the judge should have all these facts, the facts of the matter is we know in practice they don't. So I'd be supportive of the amendment on that basis. Yes, I just am quite sympathetic, but I'd like to hear what the Cabinet Secretary has to say about what does appear to be a gap in the way that um, families and children are um, taken into account when so much can impact on them and sometimes end up on the criminal path themselves uh, because of the, the, the parents, the way the parents have been. So I'd like to hear the Cabinet Secretary has to say first, and it's, it's up to you now, Cabinet Secretary. OK, thank you, Convener. The majority of these uh, uh, amendments in this group focus on the needs of children affected by parental imprisonment, and I thank Mary Fee for raising uh, these matters. However, we believe that a person-centred approach should be taken for all children and young people uh, up to the age of 18, recognise their differing needs, and so we do not believe that these amendments are necessary. The existing provisions contained in the Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014 uh, provide appropriate coverage for all of the vulnerable children, and the law uh, places a duty on, uh, for all, uh, uh, I should start that again. The existing provisions contained in the Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014 uh, provide appropriate coverage for all vulnerable children, and the law places a duty on local authorities and health boards to make services available. Uh, Amendment 107, uh, which seeks to put in place uh, secondary legislation to create a national strategy on the impact of sentencing on children affected by parental imprisonment, is also not necessary. The Children and Young People Scotland Act already contains provision to provide support as appropriate to meet a child's well-being needs. This includes a requirement on services and agencies to work together in a coordinated way. A child whose well-being is affected by parental imprisonment will receive the support they need through the implementation of Part 4 and 5 of this Act. Additionally, our national parenting strategy recognises the needs of these groups of vulnerable families. The strategy sets out a commitment to work with the Scottish Prison Service to encourage involvement between parents in custody and their children. We are also committed to providing targeted support for parents in prison to aid their reintegration and to help them to deter their own children from offending behaviour. 
In addition to this, uh, the Scottish Prison Service have recently produced minimum standards for working with children and families of prisoners. And the Scottish Government are also providing support via a number of public social partnerships in this area. Amendment 108 places a duty on Scottish ministers to provide an annual report uh, to Parliament on the number of parents who have been remanded or sentenced, uh, the number of convictions, the types of sentences and the number of impact assessments carried out. Part 3 of the Children and Young People's uh, uh, Scotland Act 2014 places a duty on each local authority and relevant health board to jointly prepare a children's service plan for the area of the local authority that is covered for a period of three years. This plan, uh, these plans will uh, be required to provide for children's services, both universal and targeted, as well as taking into account relevant services of which the Scottish Prison Service R1. And in addition, the Scottish Prison Service is currently examining options to gather information relating to parents in custody. Any formal recording of such uh, it will ensure that children's rights are also safeguarded whilst meeting the relevant and appropriate data collection processes. Uh, this amendment also seeks confirmation of the total number of children affected by parental imprisonment who require a children's plan under section 33 of the Act. I do not consider that collecting and reporting on the number of children's plans for these children will be useful or necessary. Rather, we would propose that local authorities and health boards should consider whether or not a child affected by a parent imprisonment a period or a period imprisonment it requires a children's plan to be put in place. Amendment 109 specifically calls on the, for the introduction of child impact assessments. However, the named person service is for every child to help ensure that concerns are picked up early and no one, including the vulnerable, are left without support. As referred, by, referred to by Rod Campbell, the 2012 Commission on Women's Offenders, chaired by Dame Elish Angelini, concluded that current arrangements for quote, social work reports adequately cover any consideration of the impact of imprisonment on children. And an additional report would add to the many reports and papers that a court has to consider. These existing arrangements already provide for the accused uh, parenting uh, uh, or the other uh, care of responsibilities to be brought to the attention of the court before they are sentenced. And the defendant solicitor can also explain their circumstances in mitigation. The introduction of such an assessment would have a considerable impact on the court and on criminal justice social work processes. And therefore, ask the committee to reject Amendment 107, 108, and 109. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. May we please to wind up? Thank you, Convener. Um, I note the, the, the comments of the, the, the Cabinet Secretary, and I'm grateful for the supportive comments um, from the committee. Just to clarify the point that Margaret Mitchell raised about when the impact assessment would be done. Amendment 109 would require a child and family impact assessment to be undertaken when a person is remanded in custody to await trial or sentencing, or when a person has been sentenced. It would take place after that point, not prior to that point. Um, and the point that, that John Finney picked up, and, and to a degree Rod Campbell picked it up as well, there is good practice, as John rightly said, but that good practice is not mirrored across the country. Um, key justice services are not under GERFEC duties, so children often remain hidden and unsupported, and too often the voices of children are not heard. And my amendments would allow their voices to be heard and the correct support to be given. Um, my Members' Bill consultation highlighted significant gaps in current service provision and practice. And while there is, I, I repeat, good practice in working with children, it is, there is not a consistent approach and it depends on which part of the country you are in. Um, so, bearing in mind what I have said, I am pressing my amendments. Thank you, Mary. Um, the question is, Amendment 107 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Abstentions? So I'm back again to the position I was in before, and as I feel that there's... Um, I hope that... 
the Cabinet Secretary has taken on board as the expression is everything that Mary Fee has brought, because I think she brings essential. However, I'm not supporting your amendment, but I thought you brought essential points to the table, so that is not agreed to. Um, I call Amendment 108 in the name of Mary Fee. Ready to debate with 107. Mary, to move or not move? Move. The question is Amendment 108 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There'll be a division. Those in favour, please show. Three. Those against, please show. Abstentions? Three, four, four against. In two abstentions. Were there two abstentions? Two abstentions, I beg your pardon. That's disagreed, it's not agreed. Call Amendment 109, the name of Mary Fee. Already debated Amendment 107. Mary, move or not moved? Move. The question is Amendment 109 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. There will be a disagreement. There's a disagreement. Those in favour, please show. Five, four. Those against, please show. It's five in favour, four against. That amendment is agreed. And that concludes uh, stage two for today. Thank you, Mary, for your attendance. And I thank the Cabinet Secretary and his officials. And I'm suspending until before we go on to the next item of business, which is stage one report.
Uh, I'm, uh, now we move on to item 9, a declaration of interest. I welcome Gavin Brown to the Justice Committee, who is here as Bill's substitute for Margaret Mitchell for the next item. I invite Gavin Brown to declare any interest relevant to the committee. Could we just like to declare that I am uh, retained on the role of solicitors in Scotland. Thank you very much, Gavin. We now go in private session to discuss a draft report.